How y'all doing this morning? You look marvelous. Uh, going to my fourth week here. Yeah, it's coming along. You start calling me Harry, not Greg. I'm Pastor Harry. All right. Uh, you may have noticed a little. Oh, by the way, if you're visiting, my name is Greg Boyd. I'm a teaching pastor here at Woodland Hills Church. And I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad all of you are here, whether you're here for the first time or not. Uh, you may have noticed that the church has a little bit different look as you drove in this morning. Uh, we had to do some repairs, uh, some bricks were falling out, and we had to do some tuck pointing, and then we had to paint over that anyway, so we thought as long as we were painting over that, and in light of the fact that the rest of the building's peeling and coming off, we thought we'd just paint the whole thing, and rather than boring beige, uh, they went with green, and so we're having a more colorful church. Isn't that wonderful? There you go. Yay. Just want to explain what is going on out there. We are uh, studying the book of Colossians, and at the end of this message, we'll have time for some questions. So, uh, as I'm going through this message, if you get questions that you would like to ask, just text them. Keep your phone on, on, on vibrate, but you can uh, text in the question to that number right there. And uh, we'll get to some. We had some really good ones last uh, that almost stumped me, one of them. I was like, well, that was, this is what I like about it. It's, it's, it brings a new challenge to, to preaching. Uh, so, be thinking about that. We're in Colossians here, and uh, we read last week five verses, this hymn, this marvelous hymn that Paul uh, puts into this letter uh, from verse 15 through 20. We, we spoke on, the, on verse 15 last week, and we're going to speak on that again this week. Uh, this verse says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He's the image of the invisible God. And last week we, we noted that Jesus is, according to the New Testament, fully God and fully human. Not partially God and partially human, but he's fully God and fully human. He's God become a human. And so to be in the image of God has two connotations. On the one hand, Jesus is the perfect revelation of who God is. He reveals God. He is the one and only uh, exact representation of the Father's essence. So we talked about that last week, and if you weren't here, I encourage you to get that message. And digest that message because it's just so foundational. Uh, your character of God, uh, how you think about God's character is all important. And so it's all important that we focus on Jesus as the revelation of, of God. Uh, but he's also the, the revelation of, uh, of who humans are. We're made in the image of God. And so in Jesus, we see what God really is like. And we also see what human beings are really like, or at least what they're created to be like. And so that's what we're going to focus on here this morning. What does it mean to be fully human? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? That concept, being made in the image of God, runs throughout the Old Testament, but it's first introduced in Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 in the creation story, which says, Then God said, Let us, note the plural there, let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea. We get to rule the fish. Fish, obey me. Uh, we get the birds in the sky, and over the livestock, and all the wild animals. And over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Note the emphasis there. That image thing is very, very important. Male and female, he created them. Male and female are equally in the image of God. So I'm going to title this message, uh, uh, what was the title? Yes, God Lookalikes. God Lookalikes. Because we'll see that this is what it is to be in the image of God. You're a, a God look-alike. Pray with me here for a moment. Father, I, I thank you for every person in this auditorium, every person who is podcasting, our podrishioners, every person who's tuning in through television or any other way, Lord. I thank you that they're here, they're listening to this. And, and I pray, Lord God, that uh, you would open our hearts and open our minds to receive your word. And I pray that that word would have an authority that goes way beyond human authority, an authority that comes from you. Lord, make your word sharper than a two-edged sword to pierce us in, in, in helpful ways, to cut away lies in our heart, calluses in our heart, lies in our mind, and, and God, to transform us to be the fully, full human beings that you've created us to be and saved us to be. Let your word go forth, Lord God, in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. amen. All right. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Now, to understand the co any kind of biblical concept, um, it's always important to try to uh, understand it the way the original audience would have understood it. We want to get back and, and get into the culture 
uh, to, to see what the meaning was in that setting. All right? So I want to look at this concept of the image of God and put it in its ancient Near Eastern culture. Ancient Near East, that's the environment that the ancient Israelites lived in. It's a Mesopotamia, Canaan, Egypt, that whole Middle East. And look at how this concept functioned there. And that's going to shed light on what it means in the Genesis narrative and what it means for us today, okay? What we know from archaeology and, and writing and things of that sort is that uh, all the ancient groups, other than the, the Jews, were polytheists. That means they believed in a lot of different gods. But the gods that they would have a relationship with or their kind of tribal god or the gods that were important to them, uh, they would make idols of them, statues of them. And those were referred to as the image of God, statues. Here's a statue of Anu. Uh, he's the Sumerian sky god. He's the god who's in charge of the stars. And when they saw a shooting star, they thought Anu was throwing it and things of that sort. And so he's got a, a, an image. And uh, they believe that the image, this idol, was, was the physical representation of the divine being, the god. They didn't believe uh, that the, the statue was God. They made a distinction there. But they believed that the statue was the image of the God and was the physical representation of that God. They believed that, um, at least some of these folks believed, that when an, uh, an artist would uh, carve out a statue, whether from wood or stone, that the spirit of the God would, would, would sort of work through that artist uh, in order to ensure that the image uh, really did represent him. There was some correspondence between the image and the God that is imaged. And so the gods wanted their physical representation to look like them, or at least to display some of the character that they had. I don't know why Anu would want such an ugly picture of him, but that's Anu's problem, not mine. Okay, so they, they, they believe that this, the spirit of that God would work at, to fashion uh, an, a, an image, his own image, a physical representation here on earth. Uh, they believe that, that while the image was different from the God, that there's a close relationship between them. In some sense, the God inhabited the statue. And the relationship was so close that what you did to the statue, what you did to the image, you did to the God. So if, if you bowed before the statue, you were bowing before the God. If you worship the statue, you're worshiping God. If you sacrifice for the statue, you're sacrificing to the God. On the other hand, if you're neglecting the statue, you're neglecting the God. Uh, we have accounts of gods getting irate because their statue was becoming desecrated, their image was being ignored, or something of the sort. So what you do to the statue, what you do to the image, you do to the God. When we understand the Genesis account in that context, it takes on a, a kind of a, a, a unique and deeper meaning. It means that we human beings are created to be God's physical representation here on earth. It means that we are created to, in significant respects at least, look like God. It means that we are God lookalikes. We're, we're fashioned by him in his own image. As uh, one author put it, uh, Carl Loning, in, in a book that was on this topic, he says, Humans, in the Genesis account, are to be in the world as a kind of living image or statue of God. Living, living image or statue of God. Turn to the person next to you and just say, you are a statue of God. Go ahead, just do it. You are a statue of God. You are a statue of God. You are a statue of God. No, you are a statue of God. You are a God lookalike. Tell them that you're a God lookalike. You are a God lookalike. All right, see? that feel good? Yes. It's true. You are a God lookalike. Amen. Now, in the Genesis account, there's three, at least three, uh, ways that are suggested that we're supposed to look like God. On the one hand, we're alive, uh, and God is a living God, and so only a living, only a living being could, could, could image that God. A second thing is that we are created to rule. God rules the cosmos, but we're created to, to rule the earth. We saw that in the Genesis account. And so we image God by the way that we rule. Uh, our first mandate was to take care of the animals and to take care of the land. Now remember, to rule, we're supposed to rule the way God rules. That's how we image him. And God doesn't exploit us. Right? He doesn't oppress us, doesn't just use us for his own purposes. So also, as we're to rule, we're not to exploit animals and just use them for our own convenience. We're to take responsibility for them. And that was our first mandate, and it's still our fundamental call. I think it's one of the best criteria to discern how we're doing as a species. How are we fulfilling that first mandate? And frankly, I don't think we're doing a very good job. 
Uh, but, but that is there. We model God. We image God. We've got say-so. We have say-so. What we, what we decide to do from how we eat and how we live and all of that, it affects the animals and it affects the earth. And our job is to use our say-so, our rule, and bring it in line with God's will. And that way, God's will gets done on earth as it is in heaven. See how that works? God, God is Lord over creation by means of human beings who are the landlords of this place. Okay, We're sort of his viceroys, his administrators. And that was our job from the very beginning. It's still our job. In fact, the goal, ultimately, this is heaven. It's not some kind of f- fluffy place in the sky where you're playing harps and whatever. No, it, it, it's going to be a perfected earth and, and will be re- 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 restored to this position of rulership that God always had in mind. That's why the New Testament says that if we endure... We will reign with him. We're co-rulers with him. We're the bride of Christ who's going to sit on the throne with him and, and in, in loving, benevolent ways uh, rule uh, this, this plot of land within God's good creation. So we, we model God by how we live, by being, by being alive. We model God by how we rule. And finally, we model God by the fact that we have a capacity for loving relationships. There's no other creature on the planet that has that capacity to this degree. Uh, this is why, in the text, it says, let us make human beings in our image. It's the only time the plural is used. And as we look back on that from a Christian perspective, it, it, it's clear that this is the triune God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit talking. And God puts the us-ness of his triune being. He is perfect relationship from all eternity. And when it comes to making human beings, he puts that us-ness into us. We're created for relationship. We're created to m- model uh, and to mirror the perfect love of the triune God. And this also is, is part of the plan from the, from the beginning. That God's perfect love would be replicated on earth. As we love God, as we love one another, as we love ourselves, and as we reflect that love to the animal kingdom and to the earth. We're created for loving relationships. Now, if you understand that, and what it is to be in the image of God, the physical representation of God on earth, it gives kind of a new, new meaning, new significance to the first two commandments, which are our prohibitions on making graven images. And so, for example, we find in Exodus chapter 20, here's the first two commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Nothing. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. One way that the, New, the, the, the Israelite faith was different from the faith of the neighbors in terms of this image thing is that uh, how, how, how you treat the image is how you treat God, but we're never supposed to worship the image. We're never supposed to worship other human beings or anything else. Worship is to done, be done only towards God. But see, here what, what we find God saying is this. I don't want you making images of me because I already have an image. I've already made my own image, and it's you. You are my, my image. And so don't be selling share, as it were, shares or stock in, in, in your image-bearing capacity to stones and wood. No, no, you are this. And you alone are this. This is your dignity. This is your significance. This is your value. This is your identity. And so don't be transferring that to, to wood and stone. And God's jealous in this passage, I believe, not because he's threatened by other deities or, you know, he wants to be sort of self-centered. He's jealous for us. He doesn't have any competition, but we do. In our fallen condition, we're inclined to, to pass that image stuff on to other things. And so he's saying, don't be like your neighbors who create images of, of the gods. No, no, you just model me. You are my image. And don't give that right and that value and that responsibility away to anything. Today, we might put it along these lines. We might say, look, at you're in the image of God, the beautiful God, the radiant God. So don't go finding your identity in, in the house that you have or the car that you drive or the money that you acquire or your achievements. No, no, you, you get your worth and identity from the fact that you're created by the, the almighty God, the creator God. And, and, and you bear his image and your physical representation here on earth. That is our life, and that is our value, and that is our dignity. That is our worth. Amen. Now, when we fell, when we rebelled, and the story is told in Garden of Eden, um, we, we subjected ourselves to the demonic powers, and we've been oppressed, and we fell into sin. And that tainted our image of God nature. It, it put, like, mud on the statue. You can't see the image of God as well because there's all this mud there. The mud is our sin. And our oppression. And so it was tainted. It was damaged. 
But it was not destroyed. No, no, this is hardwired into us. It's damaged but not destroyed. So, So we're still alive, but we're rarely fully alive. Fully alive in the way that would represent the fullness of life that's found in God. And we eventually die because of the spiritual oppression. Uh, we're, we're, we, we still rule. We still have say-so. Our decisions still affect things. But we often don't use that say-so, that rule, uh, in ways that reflect God's character. We don't bring our, our kingdom under his kingdom. So his will is not always done on earth as it is in heaven. We do our own will on earth and, and instead of, of aligning our will with his will. The image is still there, but it's tainted. And we have love relationships, but we rarely love, in our fallen condition anyways, the way that God loves. We have love relationships, but we don't love as passionately as God, and often don't love as unconditionally as God, uh, and don't love as self-sacrificially as God. The image is damaged, it's not destroyed, but it is tainted. So Jesus comes to reveal the true God to us, Wiping away all the deception that we've had about God. He comes and reveals the true God to us, as we said last week. But he also reveals the true human because he's fully God and fully human. He reveals who we really are. He puts on display. For us, we've, had our, our, we've been blinded to some degree about what it is to be human and, and, and what it is to be a representative of God on earth. He comes and, and shows us exactly what it's like. He reveals the true us to us. And so in Jesus, we see what it's like to be fully alive in a way that mirrors the fullness of life that, that God has. And in Jesus, we see what it is to have, have someone, a human being, bring their rule, their domain, their influence under the rule of God and to do it in a perfect way. That's why Jesus always says, I, I do nothing except what I see the Father doing. He, he's always submitting his will to the Father's will. And in Jesus, of course, we see what it's like uh, to, to manifest the love of God perfectly, to live with perfect love. You know, what it is to love your neighbor as yourself and to love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. Jesus reveals the true image of God. He's the image of the invisible God. But he doesn't just reveal it to us, like show us or give us information. When Jesus comes and through his sacrificial death and resurrection, he breaks the power, the, the, the stronghold that the enemy had on us. And now through the power of the Spirit, he empowers us to live out once again that restored image. We, we, we said several weeks ago when we were talking uh, about verse 13 uh, in, in Colossians chapter 1 uh, that, that we were in the dominion of darkness. Remember this? We were in the dominion of darkness under the authority of darkness. But Jesus came and he rescued us and brought us, transported us is the word, transported us from that domain into a new domain. It's, it's the kingdom of light. It's the kingdom of the sun. And we showed several weeks ago that what that involves is nothing less than being incorporated into the Son. We're placed in Christ Jesus. You have that, that, that saying all over the place in the New Testament. We are in Christ. We're loved in Christ, saved in Christ, holy in Christ. And, and when we're put inside of Christ, all that is true about Christ now is given to us. That's our inheritance. And so uh, Jesus is part of the triune God and dances with God. And as we are in Jesus, we now dance the dance of the triune God being loved with the love of God and, and now having that love flowing uh, through us. Uh, all that is true of Jesus is now given to us. All that's predestined for Jesus now becomes predestined for us. Uh, and so the power that he has to live out the image of God nature is now given to us. Everything that Christ has by nature is given to us by grace, including now the power to live as a true human being. To live out the way we were originally created to live out. To, to, to manifest the fullness of life. And to put on display the glory of God and the love of God and the beauty of God. Amen. So I want to show two areas, two, two, uh, two applications of this uh, for our life here this morning. It means, since we're in Christ and have now the image of God nature restored, it means that we now have the ability to live a full life. You can be fully alive. Yes, we're yet in the, under the oppression of the power, so our bodies yet age and we die. That will be corrected soon enough. But even in this context, this fallen context, we have now, as the restored, uh, restored people who bear the image of God, we have the power to live, be fully alive, to manifest God's fullness of life. God is glorified when we live fully, when we live passionately. God is glorified when we don't just play it safe and stay in the middle of the road and settle for mediocrity. God's glorified when, when we get passionate and, and, and we, we put our everything into living in the here and now. 
God's glorified. I, I, Irenaeus, a uh, second century theologian, I quoted him last week because he's my, one of my favorite early church theologians. He said this, the glory of God is a, is a person who's fully alive. Why? Because, see, God is full, fullest of life. We're made in the image of God, so we image God when we are full of life. We're to be living on the edge, full of life, passionate, the glory of God. You glorify God when you're putting your everything into living. Jesus said this uh, in John 10. He says, the, the thief comes to kill and to steal and destroy. And he's talking about Satan there. The thief comes to kill and to steal and destroy. But I've come that you might have life. Hallelujah. And, and to have it to the full. To have life to the full. He's saying, I've come to restore your image. You were created to live passionately, dance passionately, love passionately, celebrate passionately. I've come to restore that. And so don't let the enemy steal this from you. There's an enemy out there who wants to kill the glory of, of, of you as the image of God bearer. He wants to steal the dignity of, of the fact that you're a God lookalike. He wants to, wants to destroy the, the glory of, of you as a God lookalike. Don't let the enemy do it. He's saying stand fast. Stand fast in the freedom and the beauty and the dignity that you have as one who is a God lookalike. Uh, and don't let the enemy steal that from you. Don't, don't buy into the enemy's lies that suck that fullness of life out of you. Yeah, we, we, in this fallen world, that is yet oppressed. Uh, we hear a lot of things, and we internalize a lot of things growing up and day by day. And uh, a lot of it, most of it, is crap and lies. Uh, we don't hear very often, I don't think, most of us. You're a God lookalike. That's why I had to say it to each other. You, you, you look marvelous. You are a God lookalike. Let me tell you. You are the spitting image of God. Don't hear that so much. A lot of other stuff. And that one, not so much. I, I, as I look back on my life, um, I think it was a fairly average upbringing, but, but I didn't hear too much. Greggy, you are just the spitting image of God. Didn't hear that very much. <laughs> heard, uh, you are a bad boy. <laughs> Mr. Boyd, you are in big trouble. I heard that a lot. <laughs> Mr. Boyd, I'm very disappointed in you. Even, you disgust me. Heard that sometimes. Heard, heard uh, what's wrong with you? Why can't you just be like your brother? Why can't you just be like your brother? Heard that quite a bit. What are you, stupid? Got that sometimes. What are you, d -d 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 dumb? Because I used to stutter and I heard that a lot. Heard a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, spit an image of God. Not so much. Not so much. But it's all right. Big hairy deal. Who cares? Uh, because I now know, I now know the true God in Jesus Christ, and I now know who I am in Jesus Christ. Amen. I know my true nature. Who cares? Who gives a rat's behind what anyone else thinks when I know what God thinks? And he's told me that in Jesus Christ. Don't let any lie steal the glory and the dignity and the value that you have as an image of God bearer. No, no, no. Jesus has restored this. Jesus had restored this. Who cares what anyone else thinks if they say that you're ugly or you're a loser or you're a heretic or you're fat or you're smelly? Even if that was true, it doesn't change the fact that you bear the image of God. And so I'm here to tell you, on the authority of God, you are a God lookalike. On the authority of God, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. On the, on the authority of God, you, you have got unsurpassable dignity and unsurpassable worth and unsurpassable value. And you're loved with an everlasting love and he finds you beautiful. No, if, on the authority of God, I'm telling you, you were worth God dying for. God thought you were worth dying for a hellish death. You were worth it. And God's not stupid. He's not stupid. And so I'm here to tell you on the authority of God that if he thought you were worth dying for, God dying for, then you were worth God dying for. Why? Because you bear his image. And he loves his image. And, and he wants to rescue his image. You were worth that. God's not stupid. In fact, God is infinitely wise, right? He's infinitely wise. He knows the right value of everything. And so any thought that you have or any feeling that you have inside of you that doesn't agree with that, any thought or any feeling that you have that is, is less than the value of and the truth that you are worth God dying for, anything in your mind that disagrees with that, that thought, that feeling is stupid. Because God's smart, right? So if you disagree with God, if you say God is wrong, that's, it's pretty stupid to say God is wrong. Can we agree with that? Like, saying God's wrong, no, 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 I, I wouldn't do that. So if you've got stuff in your brain or in your heart, or maybe you're receiving it right now that doesn't agree that you're a God lookalike that's worth God dying for, well, that's a stupid thought. 
That's a stupid feeling. And so when those things pop up, which they do now and then, when they pop up, uh, don't even give it the dignity of arguing with it. Don't, don't even give it the dignity of getting mad at it. That's not going to help. And that, 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 it doesn't help. Just notice the thought, notice the feeling. And you're, you're now not viewing yourself as, as having that value. You got that loser thought going on in your brain. You got that um, ugly thought going on in your brain. You got that dumb thought going on in your brain. Whatever, whatever the echoes of, of the lies that you've internalized. See, every one of those lies can suck the fullness of life out of you. And so when you notice that stuff, you just say, man, is that stupid. And just set it aside. Don't get mad. Don't argue with it. Just set it aside. And then remind yourself of what is true. And what is true? What is true? Just by virtue of the fact that you're created, what is true is that you are a God lookalike. You know, maybe you always act that way. Okay, maybe, you know, it's not really apparent, but, but it's hardwired into you. You are created like this. You are created as the image of the invisible God. You are the creator's physical representation here on earth. And you were worth God dying for. And all the people of God said, amen. 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 Be fully alive. Know who you are. Celebrate that. Love that. You're supposed to. It's good. Secondly, it means that we have an unending capacity to love. Being in Christ and having our image of God restored, we now have the power, a limitless power, for love. We're created in the image of a God who is perfect love. And so we image God by manifesting that perfect love. God put the usness of God into us when he created us. And we have the capacity to replicate that usness, replicate the love of the triune God. In fact, this is the most important aspect of our dominion, of our rule. We have say-so to affect things. We're supposed to use it to rule the animals and the earth. And, and to do that in a way that reflects God's character is to do it in love. And so everything we do is to be done in love. That's why Paul says, 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let everything you do be done in love. This is the most important dimension of our image of God nature. We're to reflect his love and character at all times. Love our neighbor as ourself. Now, remember what I said earlier, that what you do to the image, you do to God. Every ancient Near Eastern person would have understood that. To say image of God means what you do to the image, you do to God. The only, we, we only worship God the way we treat the image is the way that we treat God. The way we think about the image is the way that we're thinking about God. Now, this applies first to ourselves. We are ourselves in the image of God. And so how you think about yourself and how you treat yourself, well, God takes that personally. What you do to the image, you do to God. Uh, what it means is that, that part of what it is to love God is to love yourself. You're loving God when you love yourself. Some people think that loving yourself is some, somehow in competition with loving God. Uh, but no, see, what you do to the image, you do to God. So part of loving, your, loving God is loving yourself. I, I get so irritated so grieved when I hear this theology that's out there, uh, I've called it maggot theology in the, in, in the past, because people think that they're glorifying God by making themselves into maggots. Or by, you, know, you know, it's this kind of humility. I don't think it's really humility, but they, they say things like, oh, there's not one good thing in me. It's not one word. I, I, I'm altogether worthless. I'm nothing but a sinner. I'm just drudge. I'm just a maggot. How could God possibly love me? But he does, and I'm thankful for that, but I am just a, a low life. And you think you're glorifying God. I must be nothing so he can be everything. As though you're in competition with God. Knock it off. That's trash talk. Look at, look at, look at. You make it, God, last I checked, God is not trash. So why make yourself into trash? God doesn't make trash. He makes you to be a representative of him. And, and he is glorious and he is beautiful and he's magnificent. So, so don't go beating yourself up with this, I'm a maggot and I'm worthless and there's no good thing found in me. Now maybe a lot of the stuff you do is pretty worthless and pretty ugly and yeah, we got that and we got to clean that up and he's going to clean that up. But you, you as an image of God bearer, no, 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 don't, don't go pounding yourself into the ground. Rather, appreciate and celebrate the fact that you're an image of God bearer. Appreciate and celebrate the fact that he's, he, he's, he's made you, fashioned you into his own image. You're supposed to love that. It's okay to love yourself. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. That presupposes that you're loving yourself. Now, we don't do it in a prideful way or a narcissistic, self-absorbed way. No, don't do it that way. But that's not real self-love. That, that's, that's, that's psychological compensation. People who are self-absorbed and narcissistic is because they're empty and they're trying to get full and all sorts of other stuff. That's, that's self-loathing. 
that it looks like self-love, but it's not real self-love. No, genuine self-love is when you, you, you accurately assess yourself as having this worth that was worth Jesus dying for, and you celebrate that because you are made as a God looker like you're fearfully and wonderfully made. So it's okay to love yourself. It's not okay not to love yourself. Amen. But it applies to everybody else as well. What you do to the image, you do to God. It applies to all other human beings, for they too are made in the image of God. We see this really clearly taught in the teaching of Jesus on the final judgment. Uh, he says this. this is the, he's on the judgment throne. He says, then the king, this is part of what he says here, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. That's our inheritance. For I, I, the king is saying this, I, the king, was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. And I, the king, was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. Then the righteous are going to say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Then the king will say, reflecting this belief that permeates the ancient world, but you do the image you do to God, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Why? Because they are in my image, and what you do the image, you do to the creator, the God who's imaged in that image. Think about this. Well, what it means is that when, when, we, when we sacrifice to provide food for the hungry, we're feeding God. From God's perspective, we're feeding God. Conversely, if uh, we just hoard our resources to have uh, more food than we need and uh, neglect those who are hungry, we're letting God go hungry. From God's perspective, we're letting God go hungry. What you do to the image, you do to God. And when we sacrifice to provide clothing and shelter for folks who need it, we are providing clothing and shelter for God. But if we don't do that, and because we want to hoard the resources so that we can have more shelter than we need and maybe more clothes than we need or better clothes than we need, when, when, when we hoard resources, we're neglecting God. We're letting God go naked. We're letting God go without shelter. Uh, and Jesus also mentions in this passage, I didn't read it, but he mentions about what you visited me in prison. The prisoner, which I, you know, this kind of represents all who are locked in human judgment. The, uh, all who are, are, are locked up by the judgments of society. When we visit them, when we befriend them, and, and don't judge them, then we are befriending God. Uh, we're embracing God. But when we don't do that, maybe when we rather join the side of the self-righteous who judge those folks and put them in the prison, those who are most despised by society, especially the religious culture, well, then we're judging God. What you do to the image, you do to God. So the question then becomes, and this is what I want to leave us with here, and then we'll take some questions. But the question is, how are we treating God? How are we treating God? It's way more important, really, than, well, it's not, it's more important than the question, what do you believe about God? Because we can easily be self-deceived about what we believe about God. It's like a husband's self-deceived when he thinks he's loving his wife, but he's treating her like trash. The question is, how are you reflecting your attitude towards God and how we live? How are we treating God, which is to say, how are we treating the images of God? And remember that this applies to everybody unconditionally. This is true just by virtue of the fact that they're created. Nothing else. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter how they look. You, it doesn't matter whether you uh, love the, the, the way the person lives or you loathe the lifestyle of the person. That doesn't matter. It's inconsequential. They're made in the image of God. It doesn't matter if they're a friend or they're a foe. It doesn't matter if they're blessing you or they're threatening you. Doesn't matter if in society's terms they're on your side and in your country or, or not on your side and against your country. They're created beings who bear the image of God. And what we do to the image, we do to God. Yeah. See, so I, I love this quote by Dorothy Day. Um, it's one of the most convicting quotes I've ever come across. She says, We love God as much as the person whom we love the least. We love God as much as that person whom we love the least. Ooh, I love it. Mm. This is a question to. And that's a truth that, that, that it would do you well, do me well, to ponder every day. Right now, I'm going to have an exercise before we go to the questions. Uh, the exercise is this. Right? Think of the person whom you love the least. Holy Spirit helps to be honest. Right now, just honestly, who, pick out one person that comes to your mind that you love the least. Maybe it could be, it could be for some, Al-Qaeda. For others, it could be their mother-in-law. Uh, for some, it might be father-in-law. Uh, for some, it might be yourself. For some, it might be yourself. Uh, it could be the office worker who's driving you crazy. It could be a person who's still alive, or it could be someone who's dead that comes to mind, that, you've never, that you still hold a grudge against for stuff that was done or said or whatever. Who do you love least? Get a picture of them in your mind, however you do this. 
Envision them. Maybe if you're doing it vividly, it would even it makes your heart race just to think about them. That's good. That's good. Let it race. I want you to envision them. And as you're envisioning them, I want to apply this truth here. Hear the Lord say to you, because this is true. What you do to that person that you're thinking about right now is in my image. And the way you think and treat the image is what you think and treat me, how you, how you think about and how you treat me. And so hear the Lord say as you're envisioning this person, will you agree with me that that person was worth me dying for? It's okay if you still don't like things about them. That, that's true. And it doesn't mean you're going to hang out with them or want to be their friend. Or Some people are, are untrustworthy and you need to keep a distance. But it doesn't change the fact that they're made in the image of God. So hear the Lord say, will you just bless them and pray for them and let go of judgments on them? What you do to the image, you do to God. See, that, that, that's now expressing love. Love is ascribing worth to another. That costs to yourself. So just ascribe worth to them. I bless them. They're made in the image of God. And then we pray. I'll pray. And I, I encourage you to do this exercise kind of throughout the week. Uh, it, it's, it's a good one to, to entertain that person you, whom you love the least. And then bless them and ask God to empower you to have a little bit of his heart for them and to see what he sees. And then to love the way he loves. All right, let's take a couple questions. Uh, and by the way, I, you know, we only get to a fraction of the questions here. Um, and we all had some really good ones uh, last hour. So, uh, what? what? From Gregory. <laughs> hey, Pastor Harry. I don't... <laughs> I can't get good help around here. Um, and, and so I, I encourage you to download the message. And we include all the questions from, from the, the two services uh, on uh, the, uh, the, the video there. So you can get more of the questions uh, that way. So, hey, Pastor Harry, that'd be me. I don't understand how Jesus can be fully one thing and fully another, God and human. Could you help explain this? It's beautiful. Uh, okay, so we find in the Bible all sorts of texts that confirm that Jesus is a full human being. Not partly human, not wearing a human suit. He's a full human being. And we find a bunch of other verses that clearly reveal that he's, he's God, not just partially God, he's fully God. He's prayed to, he's worshipped, he's giving the titles of God, and so on and so on. And so the church from the start has said, well, he's fully God and fully human. Uh, now, some people think that that's a contradiction. And in fact, I, I would say some of the ways that, that it's been uh, spoken of and con conveyed in church history among some theologians is a contradiction. Because it, it, sometimes it looks like they're saying this. God is omnipotent, which means all-powerful. But human beings, by, defini by definition, are not all-powerful. So then they say, well, Jesus is all-powerful and not all-powerful. Or God is omnipresent, which means he's everywhere. he's everywhere at the same time. But human beings, by definition, are not everywhere at the same time. They're not omnipresent. So they say, well, Jesus is both omnipresent and not omnipresent. Finite, but not finite. Omniscient, but not omniscient. Omnipotent, but not omnipotent. That's a contradiction. That's like saying A and not A. That's like saying married bachelors. That's like saying round triangles. It's like saying two adjacent mountains without a valley in between. You get the point. It really says nothing. It's equivalent to malipkamalililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililililil
his, his omnipotence and, and everything else that was inconsistent with becoming a human being, and he became a human being. But it's not inconsistent to be a human being who's perfectly loving. In fact, that's the goal. So Jesus has the character of God that sets aside the other attributes of God in order to be a full human being. So I don't think it's a contradiction. All right, chewing that for a little bit. Let's go to the next question. We've got, oh, it's already, we only have time for one more. You're going to have to really download this stuff because there's some really good questions that are worth chewing on. How do you reconcile that a murder is an image bearer of God? Well, how do you reconcile that a liar is an image bearer of God, or a judgmental person is an image bearer of God, or a cheat is an image bearer of God, or a gossiper is an image bearer of God? I mean, one sin, you know, sin is sin is sin. Uh, we like to rank things, you know, and, and so certainly some sins have worse consequences than others. But, but uh, uh, any sin taints the image of God, and there's nothing in Scripture that supports, that puts us in the driver's seat to look, sort of have our sin scale. Uh, so the thing is this. Uh, it's the difference between you know, having a, a picture of the uh, uh, statue of Anu. Uh, well, if, what happens if you threw a lot of mud on the statue of Anu? Anu would still be, you know, the, the picture of Anu would still be the image of Anu. It's just that you can't see it very good because there's a lot of mud on it. So also, we're still in the image of God, even though, Lord knows, we do a good job of hiding it. <laughs> we do a good job of hiding it. And part of the reason why we hide it is because we don't really believe it ourselves. I suspect that 99% of the people hearing this message right now don't really believe this. Uh, part of the brain does, but they have other stuff that doesn't. In fact, I, I think probably all of us are in that. We got mud in the brain. If you got mud in the brain, you got a mud in the life. And so, so we do a good job of hiding it because it's hidden from ourselves, which is why this message is so important. To take the truth of who you are, take the identity uh, of who you are, all the stuff the Bible says about you as an image of God bearer, as one who's re redeemed in Christ. We have a, had a statement, I don't know if you still have it, but we had a, a piece of paper with all the truths, or like some of the truths of what the New Testament, what the Bible says about you. And it's so important to take that stuff and put it in the brain and chew on it and see it and visualize it and imagine it and then step into it because what you're doing is you're, you're taking a shower. The, the truth is, is, is like a the shower that's washing away the mud lies from our life. And the more the mud lies get washed away, well, then, then the more the image of God is put on display, praise God. And, and, and now you're just revealing the truth of who you already always are. And maybe it concealed in a lot of mud. They take a shower, and the shower is truth. In fact, the New Testament talks about the washing of, 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 of the word. The word. That's why the word. Oh, I'm getting crazy here. The, but the, 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 the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And, and, and it cuts and divides. Well, let it come into your life, the truth of who you are, and cut away the lies. It divides truth and error. Uh, it, it divides the, the word of God from stuff that we've acquired, and it just carves off the mud in our life. And so whether the mud is murder, whether it's fornication, whether it's greediness, whether it's gossip, it doesn't matter. It's still mud. Take a shower. Take a shower. Can we all come into taking showers regularly? Yeah. All right. Hallelujah. From Anonymous, we've heard that Jesus is fully human and yet fully God. Uh-huh. That's true. This sounds like a contradiction. Can you explain this? Excellent. Okay. According, in, in Scripture, you find Jesus treated as a full human being. I can give you a bunch of passages that support that. And in Scripture, we find him being treated as God, given the titles of God, the activity of God, and making the claims of God. I can give you a bunch of Scripture on that. And so the church has concluded from, from the very start that Jesus is fully human and fully God. Is that a contradiction? No. If it was a contradiction... See, it would be a contradiction if being God by definition ruled out being human and being human by definition ruled out being God. Well, then you have a contradiction. And a contradiction asserts nothing. It's A and not A. So you're not asserting anything uh, when you assert a contradiction. It's, it's equivalent to, you know, and I wasn't speaking in tongues there. I was just trying to make it known that it, it asserts nothing. So it, it, it's not a contradiction. It may be a paradox, but it's not a contradiction. Now, here, here's the thing, and I think this is a really important point. The way that, the, that, that theologians have sometimes, in fact, I would say usually, uh, construed the way Jesus is fully God and fully human is, I think, uh, at least potentially contradictory, the way it's often asserted. Because they sometimes will say things like, well, since God is infinite and humans are by definition finite, Jesus is both infinite and finite. Uh, God is omniscient, all-knowing, but humans are not, so Jesus is both all-knowing and not all-knowing. Uh, God is omnipotent, but humans are not, so Jesus must be both omnipotent and not omnipotent. Well, that's, that's a contradiction. Uh, there's another way of thinking about it, however, um, that I don't think is contradictory. 
Try this out. You don't have to agree with this, but just try it out. Um, you have to, have to qu- ask the question, what, what, are the, what is the character or what are the features that define God as God and to, uh, that define humans as human? Now, let's think about this. I will submit to you, as I'm looking at Jesus Christ as the full revelation of God, uh, the fact that he is a human, here God is a human being tells me, suggests to me that being omnipotent isn't a God-defining, uh, a necessary God-defining quality. God is omnipotent by virtue of the fact that before the creation of the world, there's no, no other one, no one else had power. He hadn't given any away yet. So he's omnipotent, but he doesn't need to be in order to be God. And I submit to you, he doesn't need to be omniscient in order to be God. And he doesn't need to be omnipresent. That means he's everywhere in order to be God. What he needs to be God, I submit to you, and I'm getting this from looking at Jesus Christ, the God-defining quality is, is his character, is his love. And so if God, if one of the ways God wants to be God, he's Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? But if one of the ways God is God is involves setting aside for a time his omnipotence, his omniscience, his omnipresence, he can do that. And the, I think that's exactly what he does in order to become a human being who's not omnipotent or omniscient or omnipresent. You follow me here? And, and so he, but what, what, what Jesus keeps, which defines him as God, is the, is the, the love that, that eternally is God from all, from all eternity. He's perfect love. Jesus is that. But now he is that in a finite form. And so I don't think there's any contradiction involved in that. In fact, it seems to me that that's what Philippians 2 teaches. Uh, that uh, though he was in the form of God, though he was by nature God, he did not grasp after that. But he set it aside and emptied himself. The Greek word there is kenosis. It means, it means to empty. He emptied himself in order to become, uh, take on the nature of a servant. And that's what I think the word did. The word was made flesh. Set aside those things. Everything that was contradictory to being human, he set it aside and then became a human. But it's not contradictory to be, uh, to be a, a perfectly loving human, right? And so that he kept. And that, in fact, is why he's our model. And uh, we're to live our lives uh, based on the pattern of his. All right, I gotta be more brief than that. Next question. From Mary. Thank you, Mary. How do we overcome the damage that has happened to our image? How can I reflect God when I don't feel capable of reflecting him? Excellent question, Mary. Thanks. You're not capable of reflecting him on your own. Yeah, the image has been damaged. I don't think we're, in fact, even before the fall, I don't think we're ever supposed to image God on our own. The, it's out of our relationship with God that we're empowered to do this. And so, so you have been damaged. I have been damaged. We've all been damaged. And, and the, the image has, has been tainted, and we can't possibly reflect God's character in any kind of consistent way on our own. Thankfully, we're not on our own. And so I would encourage Mary, encourage all of us, that to uh, be cultivating a relationship with God where, where you're being transformed into his image. Uh, from a relationship with God where you're learning how to rely on his power, and you're asking him uh, to empower you to, to manifest the character of God. What you shouldn't do is to think that this is a try harder sort of a thing, like, okay, I'm supposed to be loving, okay, well, on your mark, you said go. Or I'm supposed to, you know, stop sinning, so on your mark, you said go. Uh, you, you can't do that on your own willpower. This isn't a, an ethical supposed to. No, reflecting the image of God is a, is a result of being in a relationship with God that's bringing about that image. You following me here? So it's about relying on the Spirit. And then there's d- d- uh, disciplines that we c- can be involved in, spiritual disciplines that help further transform us. Uh, being transformed by the renewing of your mind, for example. Uh, I encourage you to always be going back to the truth of who you are, uh, knowing your identity, and walking with that, and thinking about that. And whenever you notice thoughts that don't agree with your true identity in Christ, you say, man, that's a stupid thought. Well, I, I got that from mom or dad or whatever, but I'm going to put that one aside. Don't get mad at it. Don't fight it. That's not going to help. They'll just calmly put it aside, realizing it's not true, and now remind yourself of what is true. And in this way, you know, we, we grow in our capacity to reflect God's character day by day. Excellent, Mary. Do we have any other questions? If we are made in the image of God, can we worship each other in order to worship God? I love this. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's really good. Uh, why, why isn't there a name there? Well, thank you, whoever. It must be anonymous. I had never thought of that, actually. Yeah, I, you know, this is where, well, obviously, we're not supposed to worship each other. Uh, uh, that, that, that's inappropriate. And maybe it's at that point that the ancient Near Eastern image uh, analogy breaks down. I mean, these folks wrongly thought that, you know, that, that you, you're supposed to make sacrifices to and bow to and pray to the statue and that you were doing it to the God when you did that. But that's precisely where there it sets pagans apart from uh, the Israelites. Pagans do that sort of thing, but the Lord is saying, 
No, you bear my image, that's true. And how you treat one another is, I, I think personally, that's true. But worship is to be given only to, to God. Worship is, is about you know, ascribing worth, the worth that, that, that God has to him. And he's the only one that has that. There's only one being who's never created. There's only one being who created all other things. There's only one being who rules all over things. There's only one being who gave his life for us, and that is God, and, and he alone is to be the object of worship. So how we treat each other is how we treat God, but the worship part is to be directed only towards, only towards God. Excellent question. That was really, and see, this is why I love questions. I had never thought about that, and uh, it forced me to go to a different level. Thank you, whoever uh, wrote in that question. Are there any others? We've got time for uh, one or two more, if there's any others. No? Anyone from the floor want to ask a question? We've got 30 seconds here. Yes. Any, any, yeah, go ahead. Beautiful. So the question is, are we defiling God when we tattoo ourselves or, or pierce ourselves and, and things like that? I, I think there is, a, you know, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we're to take care of the temple and honor the temple. Um, but when it comes to like putting tattoos on and, and, and piercing our, our, our bodies, you know, in some cultural context, that is maybe, it has a meaning that would maybe be inconsistent with being a representative of God on earth. In other cultural contexts, however, it doesn't have that meaning. Um, uh, and so wearing earrings or, or piercing like that, I, I don't, in this cultural context, I don't see that as desecrating uh, the symbol or putting art on your body. Um, you know, I think a, a disciple of Jesus should, you know, take be interested in what kind of art you put on your body if you're going to put art on your body. Um, it shouldn't be anything to convey a message that's not consistent uh, with the, your being an ambassador of, of Jesus Christ. But that you want to put something on your body. Now, people may have different opinions about this, but my own opinion is that there's nothing inherently wrong with that. You're not, you know, uh, piercing your nose or your ear is very different than sticking a knife in your gut. And so um, uh, I, I, this context where it's wrong, but in this cultural context, you know, it's no different, I, I don't think, than putting on makeup or wanting to look your best or even wearing hair gel or, or not shaving for four weeks. Can you believe this? It's just really... Okay, one more. Yes. What about smoking, obesity, and alcohol? Excellent. Um, you know, here's the thing. There's a general principle about health and taking care of yourself uh, that I think is, is, is very important. You know, we should honor the, the temple and, and you know, take care of that. Um, on the other hand, I want to make, you know, you, you have to be careful not to get into legalism where you start to dictate the details of that. Because that could get us into big trouble. I mean, Christians have always been, you know, at least evangelicals uh, in the past used to like, like to pinpoint smoking and drinking. Those are the, the taboo ones. But they have no problems going to McDonald's every day. It's going to clog up their arteries. Uh, or, yeah, you know, or, 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 or just eating too much or staying out in the sun uh, too much, which can cause skin cancer. I mean, there's a whole, so that's where, you know, there's a whole, all sorts of things we can look at here. Uh, and I, I, so I think it's important not to try to legislate the details on that, but to encourage everyone to follow their own convictions and to pray about these kinds of things. As a general principle, take care of yourself, be healthy, uh, but let's not try to legislate uh, what exactly it's going to look like for every individual. All right. So Father, we just thank you for making us in your image. Hey, and as I'm praying here, could I ask the prayer teams to come forward here? And I'll tell you that uh, if you have any matter that you'd like to have prayed for, I encourage you to come forward and, and pray with these folks. Everything you share is, is confidential. And um, why leave here with that burden on your heart? So, Father, thank you for making us in your image. And we pray, God, as we leave this place, that we would stand fast in the truth that uh, we are made in your image and, and live life to the fullest and not uh, allow any lies to suck that life out. Father, we pray that you'd empower us uh, to put on display the fullness of life that, that is found in Jesus Christ and to put on display the fullness of love that is in Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that you continue to empower us to love all people as image of God bearers and, and God to honestly assess what our attitudes are towards all people, especially those that we have trouble loving and reminding ourselves that what we do to them and what we think about them is what we do and think about you. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people head. Amen. God bless you guys. Go out and build the kingdom.